Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. While South Korea has become a major economic power, it is surrounded by far larger players in Asia. It may never be able to play a leading role in shaping both regional and international affairs, but is currently looking for ways to assert itself on the global stage. These aspirations are typical of what scholars define as a middle power, an international actor that is neither small nor large. Our guest for this episode is Scott Snyder, who has written extensively on Korea, its middle power diplomacy, and its efforts to find a voice in international politics. We talked about Korea's role in the G20, its summit diplomacy of the past years, and its efforts to cooperate with other middle powers. Scott Snyder is Senior Fellow for Korea Studies and Director of the Program on U.S.-Korea Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations, based in Washington, D.C. He has edited and co-authored several publications, the most recent of which being The Japan-South Korea Identity Clash, East Asian Security in the United States, published by Columbia University Press. Scott Snyder received a BA from Rice University and earned his MA from the Regional Studies East Asia Program at Harvard University. He was also a Thomas G. Watson Fellow at Yonsei University in Seoul. Scott Steiner, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for inviting me. You are the director of the program on U.S.-Korea policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Why did you get interested in Korean affairs in the first place? I initially got interested in Korea back in the late 1980s, uh, right before the 88 Olympics at the time of Korea's democratic transition. And uh, I found that uh, Korean politics is um, uh, a more compelling and long-running drama than uh, any of the others on TV. Uh, And so I've continued to follow it to this day. We're going to talk about uh, Korea as a potential middle power. But first, uh, could you maybe define what a middle power is? I think that in the international relations literature, the category has kind of developed as a way of defining countries that are not great powers, but that are also capable of exerting some forms of influence in international relations. Uh, You know, small powers really don't have influence. Great powers have historically been the dominant actors that have attracted a lot of attention. Uh, But especially in recent years, we've seen the emergence of a class of countries that are not great powers, but uh, do have a stake in the international community uh, and can exert forms of influence uh, in international relations. What are the the criteria? Do they exist? Um, Can you brand any country as a middle power at some point in economics or militarily or in soft powers? It seems very fluctuating. Yeah, and I think that the category is uh, evolving. Uh, initially, you know, the first generation of middle power literature really focused on the roles and contributions of countries like Australia, Canada, some of the Northern European mm-hmm. countries uh, as middle powers. And then there's a second generation of literature that focuses on, I guess, what you could call emerging middle powers, and a lot of them are our dominant regional actors, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, India, have been defined, although India might object, countries that are dominant in their regions and, and are beginning to play uh, roles, uh, other roles in international relations. Mm. What does middle power diplomacy mean, and how does it differ from the diplomatic efforts of great powers, but also maybe of small powers? Where do you draw the line? I think that the first generation of literature in this area really defined uh, middle power diplomacy as a form of diplomacy that was committed to uh, reinforcing multilateral cooperation and reinforcing international norms or or contributing to uh, upholding of international norms. I think that South Korea, by searching for models for its own diplomacy, seems to have latched onto that particular definition. Um, One of the forums, I think, where there's more and more talk of middle power diplomacy is the G20. Is this really the one forum where you see this bridge between the great powers and the middle powers and middle powers actually having some kind of influence? To the extent that the G20 came into the spotlight uh, as an organization that uh, was going to take the lead in contributing to 
uh, financial policy uh, in the context of the 2008-2009 crisis. I think that uh, it showed uh, that the dominant economic powers in the G7 recognized that there are other uh, players uh, that could also usefully be included in that conversation. And so I think that it probably did have a kind of catalyzing effect uh, in terms of categorizing a group of countries that were suddenly able to make institutional contributions to uh, leadership uh, in the international community through an avenue that had not existed previously. So South Korea belongs to that group of countries? South Korea is in the G20, uh, along with a number of other countries that have been kind of categorized uh, in the middle power classification. And in fact, they've even banded together and formed their own grouping, as you know, the uh, MICTA group, which which we'll we'll talk about later. Um, the current administration under Park Geun-hye seems to hold more of a regional worldview, focusing on security initiatives. So would you say that this middle power momentum um, Korea as a trendsetter is maybe uh, slowing down in the last two years? It's hard to say. I mean, I think the foreign ministry is embracing this concept uh, and construct and has used it as a way to benchmark roles and activities that South Korea can be involved with. Mm-hmm. But it's true that the Blue House has not embraced the middle power concept and has instead been focusing on initiatives like the Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative or the Eurasian Initiative, Trust Politique uh, Initiative. Every year it seems Korea tries to define or redefine its foreign policy. First it was you know, about being an, a global FDA hub and bringing best, best practices, then it was all about green growth, now middle power diplomacy, then now we're moving to something else. Um, generally, we get the feeling that South Korea doesn't know what role it should be playing on the global scene. Is that, is that a fair assessment? And do you see middle power diplomacy as maybe a next step in this soul searching or maybe a, as a new selling point? I see middle power diplomacy as a useful way to benchmark characteristics that South Korea might be able to uh, adopt uh, or attributes that it can pursue as part of its diplomacy as way as a way of making a difference uh, mm-hmm. in the international community. The idea of being a convener or a bridge, a catalyst, a niche player, I think all of these ideas are uh, useful ways to try to define roles in a space that is crowded by uh, larger uh, players. It's true that um, there is a shifting uh, from administration to administration uh, and really an evolution of Korean foreign policy uh, over time. And I think that the middle power idea has helped to provide some kind of coherent vision over the course of the last five to eight years for suggesting what types of roles South Korea might Mm. play. Would you say that middle power in practice is something that countries like South Korea would brand themselves with, or do they get branded as middle powers? It's a bit of a constructivist approach, but... So far, what I see is South Korea being attracted to the concept and benchmarking it as a way of trying to define its uh, roles and opportunities. I mean, you know, really, when you take a look at this middle power categorization, there is a bit of a problematic uh, related to the concept because really everybody wants to be a great power. That means that if you define yourself uh, as a middle power, you're implicitly acknowledging constraint Hmm. uh, and limits. But at the same time, uh, it can be a way way of channeling energy to think about how to act within those limits. What does South Korea's middle power focus on uh, right now? Is there a specific vision in South Korea or in South Korean policymaking circles of what may be middle power Korea in the future? Some very specific areas or a specific role? So far, I think that it's uh, more related to function. The idea of being a node in a network or a bridge between uh, developing and developed countries or being a convener. Mm. Uh, I think those are the attributes that have defined Korean middle power initiatives. Uh, And I think that what remains to be seen is whether or not South Korea can identify some niche categories where it is really going to have value added and make a difference, especially in the ideas 
framework or conceptually. Uh, you know, there's a risk uh, that as a middle power uh, or using the middle power construct, South Korea can get so busy trying to be a convener that it doesn't actually define where it can add value. Mm. And so I would argue that that is a kind of trap of the concept of middle power or the way that it's being applied in practice that South Korea needs to try to avoid. Is Korea experimenting with, experimenting with this middle power path to move away from this image of strict trade diplomacy and that it somehow wants to graduate from that and become um, a norm setter or at least, you know, someone who's participating in really the institutional dialogue and not just trade? I, I think that uh, it does represent an effort to uh, look for ways to add value and to provide uh, leadership and give back to the international community. Mm-hmm. And it does go beyond the economic role that South Korea uh, has distinct. It it actually goes beyond, but also is appropriate for uh, the level of um, distinction with which the Korean economy has performed. If you're a top 20 economy, you should be expected to Mm. make top 20 contributions in other areas. And so... In that sense, I think that it is admirable and appropriate that South Korea in past administrations and going forward, you know, is looking for ways to uh, actively make contributions to the international community. So if we speak of the status quo Korea today, is Korea a middle power and why? In other words, is there a significant gap between how Korea perceives itself and what it actually is when it comes to middle power diplomacy? I would say that uh, South Korea has benchmarked a set of middle power characteristics that one can identify as manifested in its approach to foreign policy. And I think that uh, the concept has been useful to South Korean foreign policy in terms of thinking about how to uh, develop attributes and contributions uh, Mm -hmm. to the international community. It's a harder question to answer, does South Korea necessarily identify itself as a middle power and what that might mean? Frankly, I think that there's a wide range of views within South Korea about its own diplomacy. I think a lot of them are generationally defined. If you talk to older Koreans, I think they still are more comfortable defining themselves as a small player Hmm. because that's what they were taught. But uh, you might find among the younger generation an expectation that South Korea should play an even bigger role uh, than it's currently playing. Uh, And uh, some Korean nationalists would expect that Korea actually should be a major power. What would be the the characteristics of of, uh, Korea as a a middle power? Are we talking more about uh, expanding on ODA? Are we talking about actually... Uh, being active in um, UN operations? What kind of... So I think that what we saw, especially between 2000 and 2013, uh, was the emergence of South Korean hosting diplomacy uh, through a number of initiatives, including the G20, uh, the hosting of the OEC Development Assistance Committee, Nuclear Security Summit, major efforts uh, in the areas of green growth, And, uh, you know, that has continued, I I think, in terms of hosting into the Park Administration. We've seen uh, South Korea host major conferences on cybersecurity. There is the Pusan uh, Internet Forum. There's the World Water Forum that just Hmm. uh, occurred uh, last week, I think. The real question, I think, is... Where can South Korea add value by making ideas contributions? Uh, And how does South Korea move from the role of convener to a niche contributor in an area where its identity in the international community actually uh, becomes defined by or associated with a particular distinctive contribution? And I think that uh, some progress uh, was made, especially in the context of OECD DAC. This is the development assistance and and, and the concept of bridging the uh, newly emerging donors with the established donors, uh, thinking about not aid effectiveness, but development effectiveness, Mm. essentially infusing Korea's experience with growth into a discussion about how to uh, more effectively achieve success and development. 
But, you know, a lot of these contributions, ideas contributions, also need to be sustained. Uh, and so I think that we're at a point now, two, three, four years down the road, where we can look back at some of the hosting diplomacy that South Korea did in the early years uh, and ask, has South Korea really organized itself to continue to contribute in these areas? And unfortunately, I would say that in a number of cases, we've seen, on the one hand, great mobilization for the event uh, and a highly successful event in the moment, but insufficient commitment to sustaining the ideas contributions uh, over the long term after the event Mm -hmm. that would be necessary in order to really efficiently make a mark uh, as a middle power or make a middle power type contribution in these areas. Yeah, that would be, I think, my next question. Isn't it the easy way out to be a convener? It's actually way more difficult to start building capabilities and in, in a, in a specialty, so to speak. And, mm. Yes, but I mean, that's hosting diplomacy is actually a good way to start uh, because it puts you at the center. It allowed uh, South Korea, I think, to build on uh, organizational co- capabilities and mobilization capabilities and provided some kinds of experience in terms of managing a multilateral agenda. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, those, are, I think, are, it's a good strategy for getting in, uh, getting your nose under the tent. But then, in order to really sustain that sort of contribution effectively, you need to keep your nose under the tent, and you have to keep on investing uh, in particular areas. You know, really, when you look closely, South Korea doesn't have a lot of uh, manpower or woman power relative to many other countries of its size in the diplomatic sphere. And that means that it's all the more important for South Korea to put a premium on choosing specific areas where it wants to add value and sustaining contributions over time in order to um, provide distinction or distinctiveness to its contributions. Um, how is the Korean participation in uh, hosting of these uh, events uh, perceived from the outside? Are these efforts uh, appreciated? I do think that South Korea has been able to uh, leave a good impression uh, and has been able to successfully bring an unprecedented number of world leaders to South Korea over the course of the past few years. And so, you know, that's a good start in terms of trying to make an impression. Hmm. It's been doing uh, this at a time when other countries, uh, in particular uh, in Europe, have been squeezed in terms of their ability to sustain public goods contributions uh, in some areas. And so in that sense, I think that South Korea's uh, eagerness to try to expand its contributions in the area of development assistance or ideas contributions on green growth are welcome and needed. But like I've said before, even if you make a good first impression, uh, you have to do uh, more than that in order to be able to sustain a distinctive role and contribution in the international community. You mentioned building uh, capabilities. In which areas could South Korea realistically become a norm setter? And is middle power diplomacy the best tool to achieve um, that status? Yeah, well, I'm not sure whether I would say norm setter. I think that maybe a norm upholder or uh, or an ideas contributor in specific areas. Uh, and I think the areas that uh, South Korea really has shown itself to be most suited to make contributions in is really are, are really at the nexus of development, energy, and financial policy. And so in some respects, that's what I think makes the fact that South Korea is now hosting the Green Climate Fund so interesting. Hmm. Uh, Because really, the Green Climate Fund, uh, it's an international institution. It's about climate finance, which means it's also about potentially more efficient contributions to development. And it's about trying to adapt to uh, a world in which there's a need to restrain uh, carbon emissions. Hmm. So the challenge there is that South Korea is the host, and it became the host because it demonstrated an interest under Im Young-bak in this idea of green growth. But now that it's hosting, it doesn't necessarily have 
a role. Mm. Uh, it's not on the board, and uh, and it hasn't necessarily followed up in a way that has allowed it to do more than host. So again, you have this um, paradox of hosting providing the way in, getting your nose under the tent, but then how do you really exploit that opportunity? So you think that Korea should be a, a norm enforcer rather than try to become a a norm setter and after all it has been a great winner of the current international system so why want to change it? Yeah the middle power uh, concept I think really has been about strengthening multilateralism and strengthening international cooperation in particular areas and so what that really is about is Uh, not setting new norms, but uh, upholding and backing norms that uh, have been particularly useful in providing uh, rules of the road for the international Mm. community. Has Korea any um, chance to punch above its weight when it comes to uh, regional politics in East Asia? Korea is the smallest power. It's the the shrimp among the whales. We've heard that that many times. Is middle power diplomacy maybe a way to have a a bigger voice uh, between Japan and, and China? I actually think the area where South Korea is most constrained is in the regional context. You know, if you moved Korea to Europe, it would be a major player, but uh, Korea is stuck between China and Japan. And uh, it is true that Koreans often suggest that Korea is well suited to be a catalyzer of regional cooperation. After all, it's probably the only country in uh, this sub region that can propose an initiative without inviting immediate suspicions about ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. But the environment in the region for South Korea, I think, is really characterized by a good deal of constraint. And so even though it tries, for instance, to show the flag on Northeast Asia peace and cooperation, uh, and it's in the interest of South Korea as a smaller power in the region to promote multilateralism, The fact of the matter is that we have not seen uh, deep institutionalization uh, in Northeast Asia. Hmm. Can Korea truly be a middle power considering its alliance with the United States? Is full middle power status and reliance on the U.S. to ensure national security mutually exclusive? Or is there just no connection between the two? I, I think that the alliance and the middle power role for Korea have been primarily complementary to each other. Uh, there are areas where it potentially could become conflictual. But if you stop and think about the classic original middle powers, you're talking about countries like Australia and Canada, really countries that either are allies of the United States or are deeply sympathetic to or have had opportunities that were enabled by their relationship mm. to the United States in one form or another. You know, the second generation of middle powers is more mixed, I think, uh, and perhaps more competitive with or uh, potentially uh, less sympathetic to cooperation with the United States. Mm. And so I think that you see more tension in the South Africa, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Nigeria. You know, they are the emerging players that have their own regional dynamic and are, are, are not as concerned with upholding the attributes of order that the U.S. is most closely yeah. associated with. Um, I think you wrote in, um, in your research that the American pivot to Asia and Korea as a middle power are actually two mutually reinforcing elements. Could you maybe expand on that? Yeah, I mean, really what I was trying to get at is that the alliance between the U.S. and South Korea has been able to evolve from a patron-client relationship to more of a mutual partnership relationship, primarily as a result of the fact that uh, South Korea's capabilities have increased. Hmm. And so, you know, it's this uh, trend of increasing capabilities that I think is really at the heart of the idea of benchmarking middle power attributes. It shows that South Korea has graduated from being the shrimp among whales to being uh, a player uh, that can do uh, something. It's not just an object of uh, competition among major uh, powers. Uh, In that respect, I think that in a way you could make the argument that South Korea's emergence uh, as a country that aspired to middle power attributes has 
really also enabled the alliance to become a lot more egalitarian than it used to be. How does China fit in this picture? Is China able to see South Korea as a middle power um, on its own merits, so to speak, or does it always, you know, put this in context in the G2, you know, China versus the United States and Korea gravitating around the U.S.? Uh, I do think that there are some areas where certainly China respects some uh, aspects of the South Korean development uh, experience probably, you know, has, has learned from some aspects of, of that experience um, that have been useful in China's own development. But I don't think that mm. uh, China has really been thinking about South Korea as a middle power. China thinks about South Korea as a peripheral country, along with the other countries on China's periphery. Uh, I do think that China recognizes that South Korea is really a critical neighbor But I think that the attributes of South Korea's position when China views South Korea end up being informed more by its perception of South Korea between the U.S. and China than about uh, South Korea as an independent actor. Mm. Korea has been directing a lot of attention towards um, development. You already mentioned that. Is that a classic middle power role, actually, to be a, a very engaged in aid? And how can Korea add value to use, uh, again, that, that word you use? Non-traditional security, I think, is an area where we've seen uh, other countries uh, that South Korea is benchmarking make significant contributions. Certainly, you know, the Canadians, I think, taken a lot of pride in their contributions to UN peacekeeping, for instance, and other post-conflict stabilization. Same thing with the Australians. Uh, also, development contributions as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, non-traditional security and uh, provision of public goods in the international development area, I, I think you could say that that is uh, one area. I, you know, the South Koreans, I think, have also been quick to associate some of their uh, soft power efforts with their uh, thinking about uh, middle power roles. In 2013, the vice minister of foreign affairs, the Korean vice minister, argued that Um, when you think of South Korea's middle power, he said the world now works not hierarchically, but in networked fashion. But doesn't that language of middle powers being in a network um, still imply a hierarchy because they are still middle? You can't live in South yeah. Korea without experiencing hierarchy as a very intuitive way of trying to order the world around you. And being a middle power does imply that there is a higher order I mean. <laughs> higher order or higher value or higher a, a stronger power mm -hmm. that shapes the environment that's the reason why i'm struck by this middle power concept even though it has been used i think to you know benchmark new activities that south korea can do and new ways of doing them I'm also always struck by the idea that the concept also carries with it a certain Uh, connotation of constraint. Korea considers itself part of a middle power group called MICTA, short for Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia, which was initially created to coordinate their action within the, the G20. What is the objective of this group and what have they achieved? In yeah, I mean, MICTA has really been around now for about a year and a half. They'd issue, they've issued a few statements, I think one on North Korea, one on Ebola, I think there's a third one. Uh, you know, it's a very unusual grouping because uh, most of the groupings of this type end up being regionally based. But as you mentioned, it really does, I think, stem from the involvement of the five countries in the G20. Uh, they don't act as a caucus within the G20, but they are, I think, bound together as the putative democracies within the G20 context uh, that are not uh, part of the G7. Uh, and so in many respects, you could make an argument that they are the countries that care the most about and have the most to gain from an effective G20 process. And then they've also, I think, uh, attempted to define themselves as countries that, as generally speaking, as democracies, as emerging middle powers, can make distinctive values-based or like-minded contributions. Mm. But I think that what we really haven't seen yet is 
a coherent definition. We've seen a couple of examples, but we don't necessarily have a coherent definition of what the scope of that activity will be or how it might develop going forward into the future. So as of now, there is no institutionalization of MGTOW. There's no organization, no headquarters. Um, is it just a loose group, or do you see some inst institutionalization going on? Yeah, no, there's just an annual mm -hmm. rotating chairmanship that passes among the five, really the foreign ministers, and I think uh, an effort by the chair to keep up a website. So... And, and really, so far, this is a grouping that has functioned primarily at the foreign minister level. Uh, so, you know, one interesting question is whether or not it can develop into a head of state meeting. Uh, if it did, uh, what kind of issue would bind uh, the heads of state together? In a way, I think that it's an interesting grouping because of this G20 framework, but it also is still, I think, in formation. Hmm. Do you see any primary drivers for MICTA long term? Isn't there an issue being a middle power, but at the same time having a like-minded role in the G20? Maybe these two things uh, could be uh, incompatible. Uh, I think that the middle power characterization is actually what ends up binding these particular countries mm. together in that G20 context. And, and of course, you know, that term both fits and chafes uh, for the various countries in that particular grouping. So I do not anticipate that MICTA will end up being defined as a middle power grouping or mm. as a grouping of middle powers, because I think there are some countries, Indonesia, I don't think really wants to be think of itself as a middle power, and yet it is a very fitting partner within the G20 context uh, with uh, the other members of this particular group. So you see MICTA playing a bridging role between the major powers? Within the context of G20? Well, I don't know if it's going to be bridging. I actually okay. see uh, MICTA as uh, coordination among MICTA members as the potentially the best driver for efforts to uh, ensure that the G20 remains uh, relevant and distinctive uh, in its uh, efforts to make contributions on the international financial policy scene. Do you think an institution, to use that word, uh, like, like MICTA, could be effective because of high moral credibility in the sense that the U.S. or China will always be suspect of trying to, you know, establish a dominant position and the BRICs or BRIC are already heavily politicized? Is there maybe a niche uh, that the MICTA or equivalent could play as an arbiter maybe of someone who doesn't have, you know, a, a second thought or has a, a secret agenda? Theoretically, but I think that we don't yet see the organization cohering around an effective ideas contribution. Hmm. And so that means that it's a grouping, uh, they're like-minded, but they don't necessarily have uh, the resources to make a difference uh, and they haven't cohered around a specific idea. So I would say that really what MICTA needs is a compelling and actionable idea that is going to motivate the members uh, to drive it. Hmm. And we just don't have that yet. I think that for all of the similarities among these countries, it's uh, just as easy to find ways in which they are different or uh, really the challenge is to have all of them agree with the same level of uh, enthusiasm to work together on a particular project, uh, and that has to be defined as well. So you don't think such diplomacy can be can continue in the long run in its current form because they just don't have enough in common? Or I'd say that the organization is probably going to continue as a something that is more similar to a contact group. Hmm an opportunity, a useful opportunity for these uh, countries to touch base. But you know, until the five come together around a particular cause, it's hard to imagine that the grouping can develop into anything more than a contact group. Mm. What is your personal assessment of MICTA? Would you agree with some observers that Korea should focus on being a leading voice in the G20 itself and because it's really the only forum where it, where it can have maximum influence. 
I think there's a logic to kind of bandwagoning together with uh, other uh, like-minded countries to really think about and act to give the G20 coherence and meaning. You know, in many respects, the opportunity to make this sort of contribution to the international community is a a fleeting one, and uh, the G7 is still essentially a competitor to the G20. Mm. And in, in some respects, you could make the argument that since the height of the financial crisis, 2008 to 2010, you know, that the G20 has kind of slipped back into a secondary position vis-a-vis the G7. And so if these countries that got their seat at the table, at the larger table, you know, want to uh, make a difference and use that opportunity effectively, then actually the common interest uh, is that they should all want to see uh, the G20 making distinctive contributions uh, and driving some of the agenda items that uh, were identified uh, at the height of the crisis but now have kind of uh, lost momentum because as things have shifted back to normal, the sense of crisis has worn Mm -hmm. off and so the sense of urgency has, uh, has passed. Uh, Maybe a quick word about middle power diplomacy and North Korea. Um, South Korean politicians and analysts have repeatedly been referring to middle power diplomacy as a way to engage North Korea, or at least the North Korean issue, and to push the whole reunification uh, question forward. Does this amount to anything? Is this actually a viable option? It seems to me that North Korea is a domestic issue and middle power diplomacy may not really help there. In a way, I think the term is a distraction because Mm. really when you look at the inter-Korean relationship, I think it's still hard to escape from the long-standing frame of the division on the Korean Peninsula being uh, a manifestation of a competition for legitimacy. Right, And so where the idea of middle power might be channeled or might be attractive to some South Koreans is really uh, as a way of trying to consolidate an advantage that comes from the fact that South Korea has a standing in the international community, whereas mm. North Korea is marginalized. Right, And so this is really, I think, a part of an effort that I think that we've seen much more clearly over the course of the past five years, really since the um, sinking of the Chunan, Mm. to use international consensus uh, and to use international fora as a way of trying to reinforce South Korea's position as as the winner of the the legitimacy Mm. competition and also to kind of... um, uh, reinforce to the North Koreans that they've lost or that uh, they have been boxed in hmm. in one way or another. Maybe to conclude uh, on this middle power uh, conversation, how much does it actually matter? Do the United States and other great powers pay attention to this kind of, this track of diplomacy? Do they pay attention to these countries more than others? Or is this merely an issue, I would say, in the realm of analysis, academia, and... and, and Honestly, I don't think Mm. that most American diplomats or even scholars of international relations are really that concerned with the idea of middle power diplomacy or are very focused on it as an organizing concept in international relations. Mm. I think it's still the case that in the United States, realist thought is going to focus on power as the instrument by which to achieve objectives. Liberals are going to focus more on cooperation, perhaps, and cooperative structures. And uh, I think the middle power concept uh, is really one that is more consequential as part of the South Korean debate. Hmm. American observers, especially observers of Korea, may watch that debate. And I guess the other thing you could say about the middle power is, in a way, uh, the concept does represent a kind of repudiation of some of the literature of recent years predicting that the next stage of global governance is going to be the G0. Because you know a middle power concept still implies and upholds the idea of an order, mm-hmm. uh, whereas I think the G zero concept is one that suggests that power is so diffused that it has become unmanageable. You know, really, and, and the other area I think where this concept intersects with American themes is related to Fried Zakaria's Rise of the Rest. Mm-hmm. And so you're basically talking about power diffusion and middle power is uh, definitely, I think, a part of 
power diffusion uh, discussion. Do you welcome these new categories, middle power, mikta, or does this only add to what some criticize as the patchwork ification of international relations with even more groups, forums, institutions, and maybe ultimately talk shops? I think that uh, the middle power concept, I think it has been useful as an organizing principle for enabling South Korean thinkers to consider how to maybe improve uh, some of their foreign policy efforts. You know, ultimately, this is a category of analysis. Um, uh, it's not necessarily uh, consequential as a as a part of international diplomacy, mm -hmm. per se. It's just uh, the question is whether it is useful to those who are focused on it uh, as a way of either improving uh, foreign policy implementation or if it helps people to understand the world around them. Scott Snyder, thank you very much for being our guest today and for your time. Okay, thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.